hacks to paint your army faster and easier. With those three things, the speed of production for the army will inherently come anyway. That added tons of visual interest, very, very low effort. Saving that for smaller details so that it's still there, but you don't have to worry about it that much. It's very, very efficient way to get an army looking really, really nice. It's just a strategic process to get to a point whereby it looks good quicker. Bill Tannery, how are you getting on, Joe? It's underway. Um, I'm further along than I thought I would be already. Well, you're further along than James. <laughs> <laughs> Technically not. I started mine about six, seven months ago. So, so before Bill in Tannery terms, was a no, thing. No, but in terms of actually painting in January for it, I'm definitely further along. You haven't touched it yet. Ah, have there touched we go. It. Go have, t have touched um, it, just not in January. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah got the we split a, we split the warlock box. Didn't that we? was that was quite convenient. That because it's a it's a box of two models, of two. and we both wanted to paint the yeah. same model. So yeah, uh, absolute dream to go together, aren't they? They were so nice. To put pretty, pretty nice kit. I didn't realize that it was like one of the newer ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, so it, it, um, when they first came out, we painted some up. For I think for one preview, uh, I done I don't know. We, we, I think we did we did one. We did the um, uh, one of the. I'm going to get it wrong, but it's one of the blue. We done yeah. the and I done the Althwi one. So there's an Althwi one that I've got. Oh then, yeah, you did. And then there's the yeah. Latoc one as well. So we've got we did do both of them. But they and were, then at the same time, Ad actually did the Altark that yeah, came out yeah. as Bill Tan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, yeah, newer kit. Um, absolutely lovely. A complete opposite to putting that towel field team together. <laughs> um, I did have a bit of a uh, bit of an oopsie, an oopsie, an yeah, oopsie, a bit of an oopsie. Where like I like primed it. I put it together, and I thought that my one, yours didn't seem to have this, but my, the one that I'm doing has two like join lines down the side of the robe where just like the front and back of the robe join together and they are visible like you do need to to do them sort them out so I, I thought I'd like done enough to fill them in like just with a bit of extra glue and then sanded it over and stuff like that I'm going to guess this is a classic case of you sanded it down you've done the little gap fill and you're like this is brilliant seamless and then you prime in instantly a line appears well, 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 well I primed it and priming it black it was fine I still couldn't really see. I could see like a faint line, but like it, well, it wasn't anything noticeable. Sprayed green on it and just saw this like black line <laughs> down each side of the uh, uh, each side of the thing. So I then had to. So I did. I'd done the green spray. I practiced what we preached um, a couple of episodes ago, um, or or maybe even the last episode where I said, when you notice an issue, you've got to sort it out now. Don't mm -hmm. just leave it. Don't just put it down to like, oh, okay, well, that's how it is. And then we're going to do it. So I was like, right, stopping. It. And it's exactly what I said it was as well. It's so annoying. So I was there. I was all set up. I had the airbrush in my hand. It was full of green paint. <laughs> and I knew that I had to put that down and sort the problem out. And it's so annoying. But I, I've done it. And I just ended up just stuffing it with uh, Milliput and then sanding it all back down again. And then spraying it priming it again and then spraying the green again and it looks a lot better now so i'm glad i did it this so, goes back to what we've said about prep is everything you can't you can't skip on it i mean obviously that's like not an intentional mistake but do you know what though I, i'm like i was consciously trying to not over clean it because that's what i did with the towel kill team and i ended up smoothing a few details out and stuff like that and we'd had a brief you built yours first so we'd had a brief conversation about it where like you were suggesting certain areas to just use the foam and and, and things like that so i was like over conscious of uh, of over cleaning it and i think in doing that i ended up not <laughs> probably filling those gaps but now it's underway everything's base coated um i did as much uh, I, I wanted to use it as a bit of an uh, airbrush experiment for me as well because I, I don't airbrush that much. Mm. So I've kind of airbrushed as Lots. much as possible on this. On Have this you model. done that in the sense of like you're trying to highlight and stuff with the airbrush or are you just... For the robes, yes. For the other stuff, it's more just like... Actually, no, for the the uh, like the hair 
pommel oh, the plume thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did you airbrush the plume? Yeah, yeah. Did you? Uh, I including the, uh, I've shaded and highlighted with it with the airbrush as oh, well. That's good. Um, that's mega. I did the uh, a similar trick to to James's uh, cling film hobby hack the other day. I didn't have any cling film on me, but I had a, a rubber glove that I'd used for airbrushing. That's, too, that's, um, that's cling film hack 2.0. Yeah, and I just like, <laughs> basically I had the head off. I've used all the hobby hacks on this because I've used the uh, the temporary sub-assemblies. Yeah. I've used that and I've used... The TSA. Yeah, TSA. the TSA. Um, I'll get a toothbrush out later and I'll... <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then I, I, I like wrapped... I had the head as a sub-assembly. I wrapped the <laughs> the glove around the helmet so it was just the plume sticking out um, and fully airbrushed that. Yeah, I've, 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 it's been an experiment, but I'm happy with it so far. Yeah. Um, I'm not as far along as you, though. Yeah, I I wasn't intending on getting as far as I did. But you know when you just, you know, like, oh, I'll, I'll do like a bit. I'll get, I'll get started on it. And then like before you know it, like eight hours have gone by and you've painted most of the model. <laughs> the first um, picture you sent me, I was like, oh, it's basically done. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, you say that, but I, I done an oopsie. So is that, what we're, is that, is, is that what we're officially calling it on it that's, now? That's the official so, name. Yeah. It's an oopsie. oopsie. I think okay. it's an oopsie. No. I done an oopsie. So I painted all the cloth. We've actually done the opposite scheme to each other. So we're both doing Bill Tan, but you wanted to do green robes and I wanted to do the white with the green helmet. Yeah, I think the way I'm doing it is m the more traditional way of doing a warlock in Bill Tan. Yeah. So you see way more you green robes. Um, and then the problem with that is that you then have to like, do some kind of variation on the helmet hmm. because is it the helmet's normally green, right? No, I think normally for like for like guardians and stuff, it would be white armor with just the green helmet. Yeah. yeah. So then for the warlock, I've seen loads of different ones. I've done like a kind of split, like the front face plate is white, and then the the main yeah, yeah. shell of it is black. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's there's no. I don't think there's like any official. I don't think so. The thing. reason I wanted to do mine the white with the green was because you don't see it on characters very often, mm. and that's my favorite part of that color scheme is the green accents on white. Yeah, and I was like, well. I'm going to just do that for this model. Like, I'm not too bothered about what the like correct scheme is, whatever. But I painted all the robes. I was like, step one, it's like the biggest part of the model. As we say, like tackle the larger surface area first. Done really nice blending. I was really happy with it. It was nice and smooth. And then I was like, this is going a bit too well. And I, I didn't think about this. I got a bit carried away. So I was like, well, Bill Tan, they've got all the thorns, the freehanded stuff on them. I was like, this is fine. I'm, I'm making great headway. If I'm I making did, mistakes, I did, I'll tidy it up. I did suggest to you, I say, like, you can't do Bill Tan without having some kind of thorn work on the model because it just, it's just so classic and iconic to have that on there. Um, at which point you did some. And then, <laughs> and then. So uh, this is the classic. Started, started making it, had a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough tea. Um, didn't go well. Um, but why? It just looked terrible. Like I, I have no but on words. the white on the white. I've or... never freehanded like patterns like that, and I think my problem was I didn't really know how to make it like flow with the with the cloth. Do you get what I mean? Like normally when I'm painting cloth, I'll do some sort of like key line around like the outside or some sort of like almost like trim sort mm. of accent. But I find that with when you see the Bill Tan stuff, it's always like big, massive like patterns over the whole thing, and I, I guess just lack of experience doing that. And I didn't really plan it because I. Initially, I was like, I'm just going to do the cloth plain. And it wasn't until later that you said about doing the freehand stuff on it. And it was kind of an afterthought. And because I'd already like shaded the cloth and everything, it just didn't, it didn't work. I should have, I should have planned it going in, had an idea of like where the patterns were going to flow and like make it kind of complement the, the flowingness of the robes themselves. But it was such an afterthought. And I just sort of just sent it, just like paint on the brush, just, <laughs> yeah. just go for it. And it just looked terrible. You, it, you went to me, you messaged me, it was like, are you d I didn't know you'd already done it at this point, but mm. now it's even funnier because you'd like done it and been annoyed at it. And then you messaged me going, are you doing thorns on yours? <laughs> and I was like, what did I say? I think I well, because I thought I, I was almost certain you wouldn't do it. I'm like, if Joe's not doing it, then I can get away yeah. with not doing it. I went, uh, depends how overconfident I get or something like that. And you went, me two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... What, I got some of that Tamiya sanding foam, the like extra fine ones, like thousand grit, whatever, yeah. and just lightly scuffed it back. With, and I got the sandpaper wet because the paint was like not fully, fully cured. It was dry, like long dry, like 20 minutes, but it wasn't like, I hadn't been on the flight day or anything. Yeah. yeah. And I find that if they got that sandpaper, because it's 
You're not really very abrasive. It's not. It's barely abrasive at all. It's almost like pol- it's what you've like polishing something really. Yeah. And if you get that wet, yeah. and you just very very lightly sand it, you're basically just almost like an eraser, like with mm. with a pencil, like almost just comes off. And there'll be a little bit of scuffing, but it's so easy to tidy up. Like just going back over. And unfortunately, I did it, it did go over the blends and stuff, so I did have to do a bit of finesse to get it back to how it was. But yeah, back to square one. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to finish painting the model and then we'll reassess the thorn situation later <laughs> in the month. <laughs> if I've got a finished model, I've got a finished model. We'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mixed results, I think. Yeah. We've, I've had a few messages from people, like, because obviously we've both been posting mm. updates of ours on Instagram and I've had messages from people saying they're getting involved. And one well, guy said, said, I'll have to maybe send you like a screenshot or something, because one guy messaged me um, saying, that depending on how good my one is, <laughs> he might get one and paint it. So okay. no pressure on me. No pressure on you. No, you got no ace, pressure you, on me. You got to ace it. Now. I forgot his. I, I haven't got his username, well, but we, we'll put a screenshot up or something. We have had uh, one early submission from uh, Krangron. Well, that's uh, Neil, I believe his name is uh, in the in the Siege Studios Discord. Uh, says for the start of 2024, I was inspired by listening to the podcast. I thought I'd practice batch slash speed painting. I wanted to paint some models as efficiently as possible. Uh, blue was done in four steps. Edge highlights took 20 minutes per model. Thought that was quite quick, but this was still uh, just 3.5 hours in on that stage. Guns were black contrast paint and a quick dry brush. I added an additional highlight on the sharp edges. Uh, the Guardian heads took longer as I wanted to practice painting the heads. Overall happy with how they've come out. Also, be all tannuary. I saw, I saw those. I thought they were really good. Um, yeah, I thought that for the time frame they put in, it's a LATOC as well. And you don't see a lot of a LATOC. So later, it's not a color scheme that a lot of people often do. I think it's because of the marbling on the on, on the tanks and the armor and stuff. And it doesn't. Sometimes it's quite difficult to translate that over to the infantry. Um, so yeah, but it looked really good. I always with the marbling and stuff. I always saw that similar to how the like. I feel like you can get away with just having it on the bigger things. Like I yeah, always yeah. saw it similar to the tau sept camo. Like it's on bigger stuff. Bigger not, stuff. You don't really put it on the no infantry or whatever. No. Um, but yeah, they look really cool. I'm gonna pull out pull out one from the from the shelves for 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 Beale Tanya. Oh yeah, so as we as we established, James hasn't started yet. So I that started tends yet. to be how we operate yeah. with these sorts of well, things. Well, I'm yeah. actually I, I, look, I I'll save it. It will be I'll, like the thirty first at, at like eleven fifty nine p.m. and James will go. Oh, Beale Tanya. Shush. Well, actually, to be fair, it needs to be before that because we discuss it on the last episode of the month, don't we? So, yeah. No pressure, so, James. Two weeks. Sort easy, it out. Easy peasy. Uh, so I, I've pulled um, I've pulled something off the shelf at home. Uh, the Imperial Archives. From the Imperial <laughs> Archives, yeah. Or well, not so much the Imperial Archives uh, for this month. Um, but yeah, um, so I've, from when we launched CS a couple of years ago, um, I got, uh, we, got, we had a couple of the Phoenix Lords done because I've always loved the Phoenix Lords, Phoenix Lords uh, from from sort of Eldar background um, and I love Margan Ra uh, as a character I just absolutely think it's one of my favourite um, uh, Phoenix Lords that the Elder have got so I've got a CS Margan Ra that I've kind of like dabbled with and, and got it to probably about 40% so it's not it's not kind of like finished at all whatsoever but CS is custom service. Yeah, so it's okay. It's a, it's a custom familiar. service, Margam Ra. Um, so I'm I'm gonna finish that by the end of the month for the episode. That's what I'm gonna do. That was just to put into time frame as how long James has had that. That we had that made before the new model came out, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, it was like yeah. way before the new model yeah. came out. But I don't think we posted it because. Or we might have posted the sculpted the grey and green. The grey and green. We've definitely definitely. But yeah, done. I, I I completely forgot it. He had it, to be honest. I said to James this the other day, he's got more custom service models in a state of half finished, unpainted, half painted than I have models. models. Full stop. <laughs> it's not it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Uh well, well it's not yeah. it's not that bad. It's it's bad enough that we'd have to count to check out. I'm just <laughs> I'm just happy that I because originally James was copping out with just doing a head for a base for his Mordians or whatever. So I'm just happy that he's he's going in on an f- actual model. It gives it. me it gives me the opportunity to to finish it because um, I, I love the model and I love the character. So it's a perfect perfect thing, and it ticks something off the list of work in progress for the beginning of the year, um, which so, is kind of the incentive behind the painting calendar thing. It's also to paint variety. But yeah, plenty of us have got like it gives you an extra excuse to be like, oh, okay, that one on the whip shelf, I'll dig it out because it's. Tanuary kind of thing so yeah yeah i'm very very keen to get it done actually 
uh, and it's not and it's not green as well. So you're both doing literally BL tan for BL tan you're eating. But um, that, like I said, happy little accident because we're doing opposite schemes to each other. So yeah, 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 yeah they're good. Also, this week we had the uh, the old world pre orders in full swing. We mm. painted one of the models, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, mean, I say we. Uh, we. Adam, 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 Adam did, yeah. <laughs> I'm taking credit yeah. for that one. Yeah. <laughs> cool, you have been busy painting, George. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is the Monarch of Nehekara. I've no idea how you say that. You're going to get slaughtered in the comments. He practiced, that. He practiced that like three times before we did this. I literally, like, right in that for the Instagram post, I literally had like the, the instructions in front of me, like spelling it letter by letter. Yeah. Like, that is yeah. too much for me. But yeah. uh, it's, um, it's definitely, a, definitely a tongue twister. These two, like, the two boxes, the two army boxes are insane in terms of like when they turned up, just like the size of the box. I wasn't expecting the boxes to be the They're size. They're bigger than are. most like big boxes that you get from like it's, even. It's like, bigger than uh, Leviathan yeah. box. Like I get that it's got a rule book in it, but then so is Leviathan. But like I haven't looked at the full model count on both the kits, but. There, there must be a lot in there. I do, I do think it's actually in part because they're older sprues and the sprues aren't as <laughs> space efficient. Oh, if so you look like, at the older sprues, like separated you know, more. Yeah, like nowadays with the, there's like a million parts on one sprue, right? Like they're all like jam packed in there, and you then do, you pick up like one big sprue, and there's like a leg of a skeleton here and a arm of the skeleton. Over yeah, there. I think, I, I think the thing is obviously with this, with this release, it's a little bit different because they're just like reigniting the fires on the game, which I think is good. Um, for for, all, for everyone who's got square based armies and hasn't been, hasn't used them maybe as much as they'd wanted to over the last couple of well, years or how long it's been since AOS came out, but um, but um, but yeah, the boxes are massive, and I think one of the things is obviously in the Tomb Kings box, you get that brand new dragon model, which is it's massive. It's like I've seen pictures. Yeah, of it. it's, it's just absolutely. We, like, we I really wanted us to do that, but there was no, way, no, way. Had, no, there was no way. way we had the time frame, um, yeah. especially because like we were obviously closed for a little bit over Christmas yeah, as yeah. well which like so yeah, yeah. That, that, that weren't really going to work but um, it's really it's been cool to see everyone else's as well like the, the ones that have been posted on Instagram and stuff yeah Um, yeah. I don't know how the pre-order went I know they're quite limited but yeah um, for, for what I know they're quite limited but um, but I just think it's good that they're, that there's almost like a uh, complimentary Horus Heresy to 40k Old World to Age of Sigma. I think it's good that there is that. Tied it in a nice, neat little bow, really, because yeah. you've got like each system has got a prequel. Yeah. And each system has kind of got its own mini skirmish game. Like everything's quite even now across yeah. both AOS and 40K. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll be intrigued to hear what the game is like from the people that that loved the game previously. Like how much has this version actually changed and so on? Like I'd be actually quite interested to hear about that because I know that they, uh, released an article where they kind of just gave everyone the heads up of the armies that aren't going to be supported in terms of new law, new models, and so on. Um, and there was a few like big hitters in there. Skaven like, are in there. Skaven I know, I know. are in there, yeah. which like feels like it could have been an opportunity to double up on model ranges and stuff. You know what I mean? I guess that's probably why they haven't done it though, is because there's already the Skaven range for AOS, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, but like in terms of. For example, like how you can use Chaos Demons in AOS and 40k. Hmm. To me, that's a selling point. Yeah, models. I see that. So, like, if yeah. you if like if you could use Skaven in, well, you can't. That's what I'm getting to. You can actually use them. They gave you some in that article where they said just a heads up: these won't be supported with new models and, and everything. They gave you the rules if you did have those old armies and you did want to play those in the new the new version of the game. So, but it, it, a couple of them were surprising. Like, I think the cat, like chaos dwarves is one that everyone yeah. always wants to see and I, they're, they're not in there, but I'll, I'll be interested to see the ones that, that are, they are going to be moving forward with as well. I think it's a commitment thing as well. You've got to think about it. Like, um, like, like, like with Horus Heresy, whereby we, we, you know, hear stuff, obviously that, um, that potentially the ranges are going to increase in the future and stuff like that. The thing is, is with, with old world, it's a committable kind of thing. If they commit with every faction to start off with, that's a lot of a lot of stuff that they've got to do. Um, and really, you don't we don't know what the uptake's going to be for Old World or how many people are going to get back into it or whatever. So from from I suppose from a business perspective, going in with everything commits you to that and you have to facilitate it. Otherwise you disappoint people. If you go with X amount of factions and it comes out with that, and then the uptake is really good, 
at that point it's, it's better to then go right okay well we'll do scave and we'll do some extra bits for this we'll do some extra bits for this yeah so i, I think that's pro- like like just on heresy for example like with her- heresy it's obviously all marines at the minute but they're going to bring in solo auxilia at some point and you try to imagine that and potentially there's even like the 30k demon range or potentially there's other stuff that then can then be ported across to 40k or ported across to other yeah. bits as well which is i, I think um the only the only thing that makes me potentially think they aren't going to do that with those factions is that if that is in the you know in their mind potentially they wouldn't put an article out saying just so you know these aren't going to be supported like maybe the way down the line they could do a U turn but I don't think in this initial maybe. run even if it's successful I think they must have other ideas for different armies that they want to focus on yeah, which yeah. is is also fine like. Especially if it ends up with new model ranges and stuff like everyone's gonna absolutely love it, aren't they? So yeah, I, th- I think it's a test at the minute just to see obviously how the game does um, and see how much uptake. I mean, the, I, I don't quite mean I can't remember how many years it's been since AOS came out, but it's been a long. I think it's around twenty fifteen somewhere in there. So it's the, well, just nine years or so that they haven't they they haven't really done anything for fantasy at all whatsoever. So yeah it'll be interesting i think it's it's like i said the models have always been fantastic so so um it'll be interesting to see what they do with it but i'm i'll tell you what i'm looking forward to seeing i haven't seen it yet but the first person to do like a fully stunning bretonian yeah. army out of that box i haven't seen anyone paint the full box yet because it's as i say it's massive but that army in a large uh, in large numbers does look so cool yeah, Bretonians, Bretonians give you a great opportunity just as, because you can do individual heraldry on each of the knights, which I think is great. Um, yeah, I think that's when you do a Bretonian army really well, it it is amazing to look at on the table and also display, obviously, of course. But yeah, but um, but it'll be interesting to see. I, I hope the uptake is really, really positive because I think it's it's good to see that game come back to the forefront. So, so yeah. Should we do some uh, listeners' comments? Yeah, let's go for it. Before we get into that, uh, if you listen to this podcast every single week, we've noticed that 69% of you are not subscribed. So if you like to listen to the podcast, please do hit that button down below. It helps us to bring you these episodes every single week. Uh, first of all, we've got Commando Dave, who says, speaking of painting journals, uh, I picked up one after listening to the podcast, but I also picked up one of those little photo printers that prints two by three sticky photos. I think they're for scrapbooking uh, to put next to my journal entry. That way I have a visible... Uh, I have a visual available of what I was writing about and it helps a lot for my learning. That is great. That's absolutely brilliant. That's like 4D chess, mate. That's yeah. the next level of the the painting journal. First things first, got to, got to acknowledge the name. That's a brilliant name. Commando <laughs> Dave. That's great. Um, secondly, glad that he's picked up a book. Um, so yeah, that hopefully help you out quite a lot. And the, the idea of the printer is amazing. So yeah, I'm just gutted. I didn't think of it. Yeah, so. good, good little tip. <laughs> good little hobby hack. Oh, yeah. Cheers, Dave. Or Commando, Dave. <laughs> yeah, please address him by his official... Yeah, by his uh, official name, his yeah. Official by title. rank and title, guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, Chris Mini Paints says, uh, it definitely comes under the tools section, but I think paint is another one that I fell into the trap of wanting a full range uh, from every brand of paint until I realized that I can paint everything perfectly well with the Citadel paints and one or two other uh, color choices. Basically, you don't need every color that insert brand here has ever made to be an amazing painter. That's in regards to last week talking about like Mistakes getting caught up buying loads of tools and loads of uh, I, I'm, loads of gadgets. I'm gutted that we didn't think of that when talking about the tools thing. Yeah, um, because that that does fall into that, and and I definitely felt like that at the start. It was like I think I've spoke about it on this podcast before, where I was first buying some models again um however many years ago and the guy in the shop was explaining to me like no just use like this green that you get like here's like the the you know like the starter sets you get with like six paints in it or something he was like you'll be fine like just getting it to that and in my head i was like well no i need the exact green and i need the uh you know a step up and Mm. i need a step down and i need uh, and he was like just like You'll be fine. Like, just it's fine to just use these fates. And I wish I listened. I have a bit of a devil's advocate to this one because initially, when I first started out, I was actually like off the bat. I was like, "Well, I'll just mix paints. Like, I don't need loads of paints." And once I had like twenty odd paints, like enough to sort of mix more or less what I wanted, I thought like, "Why would I ever need to buy any more paint? Like, what are these people doing having like two hundred paints? It just seemed ridiculous." Because I thought I understood the angle of like that makes sense if you've got an army because you don't have like custom mixes you can't replicate. 
and so on. So I thought it always made sense for that. But I was like, if I'm just going to be painting like the odd figure here, small squads, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And it wasn't until like a bit, probably a bit too late in my painting journey that I realized a lot of the merit from having a lot of paint comes from saturation because with acrylics, because there's often, often they're not single pigment. When you start mixing, especially like more than one color together, they get more and more desaturated. And I found that my models weren't quite as vibrant and I was looking for. And I didn't realize for the longest time that that's because like, instead of mixing like orange into my red or white into my red, like having a more vibrant red pigment, like to start with will lead to that yeah. nicer color that I was actually going for. And I was finding that I wasn't actually getting the color results I wanted because I was too concise with my paint range. I went sort of too far the other way. I've, I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I am at the other end of the spectrum here though, with the amount of paint that I do. Yeah. Have. I mean, like, like there are extremes. Yeah. Obviously. I just want to, yeah. Well, before we get into that, like just the, to clarify though, just to bring it back in. Cause I always think the, the context of why we're talking about that is, is very important. And we're talking about mistakes that beginners can make. Mm -hmm. And while th there was another comment that um, touched on something like this, but and I just think it's important to sometimes remember these things that we're talking about and suggesting the context of when we're suggesting them, because sometimes it can sound a bit contradictory where we're, we're saying like, oh, don't buy a load of paint, but then James has got like loads of paint. It's like, yeah, we're saying for a beginner, like don't get wrapped up in having loads, of, having to have loads of yeah. paint. I still think that's a good idea. Although what you're saying is a great point. Having loads of paint isn't a bad thing. It's going to be helpful. It's also like not kidding yourself because like, for example, James has loads of paints, but he know I know James knows that he doesn't need them. It's like, we say almost like a collector's thing. It's yeah. just like cool to have. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I was, yeah, look, I, do, I do have lots, lots and lots of paint. And I, and the thing is, is like having the opportunity of choice is the thing that I like. So like, yes, I can mix these. I'd say I use a set of 40 paints in total, like my go-to paints for certain colors, tones, hues, or, or metallics, not uh, acrylics or whatever, blah, blah. Um, having the opportunity of choice and going, right, okay, I really like the exact thing you said. I need a base starting paint that is super saturated and is really, really vibrant. That might not be within those 40. And having the opportunity to pick that and use that is 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 a, a privilege rather than a necessity, I would say. Um, touching upon the point that they, that they mentioned as well, like you're quite right. I genuinely say this wholeheartedly from the day I started painting to where I am now, like Citadel paint range in all its uh, iterations has always been the core of my painting. And I, and I, like there are other paints that I use that I really, really love. Like there are Vallejos that I use. There's a there's scale paints that I use. There's, there's a uh, P3, there's monument. There's the whole other, the other ones that I do use. However, on every project that I do and every paint job I do, I'd probably say the percentage split of brand that I use, there's a higher dominance of games workshop or Citadel paint than other paint manufacturers. So I think you can easily stick with that and use that quite easily as for, for a good 90, 95% of your painting. If you only, if you've only got those paints, um, I think the only one for me that it, that I would always go to for a certain color is 950 black or Vallejo 70.950 black. That's the only one I think for me that is within that staple amount of paints but yeah you, you can definitely definitely survive and, and do extremely well just with citadel if you're listening you want some paint recommendations we've done a couple episodes now on uh, essential paints that we can't live without so we've got a few little uh, little gems that we've picked out in there but um tying off on your point joe sort of on the, the angle we come up this from i think you was uh, possibly segueing to into this people misconstrued no advice uh Got Requiem Wraith says can't help but laugh at the irony of james strongly advocating to use primer and not just spray paint, then to name drop Chaos Black, a spray paint. So with this, this was an, ex I really like this comment because obviously not only does it call out James, but <laughs> uh, no, no, I really like this comment because there's actually um, on this comment, there's a thread and a couple of listeners were going back and forth talking about this and it uncovered something and it made me think about something a little bit differently, which is that I, I actually started that. I know James was agreeing with me, but I started that conversation. Do you want to just clarify? Do you want to just clarify the sort of point that you was so, trying to make? So basically, because Jules got <laughs> confused at this as well afterwards, which it turns out, I wanted. I was coming at it more from when I said, "Oh, make sure you're not using just spray cans as opposed to primer." I was coming at it more from like when I started. I I was going in like the pound shop and like or, or like. Or, Dollar Tree or whatever for Americans. And then like, 
getting like the cheap spray cans in there and and just rat, like putting them over models and stuff like that. Um, something that wasn't designed for miniature painting, regardless of where it came from. Something yeah, for like yeah. Home improvement or yeah. Although also, I do think there are probably certain ones that are designed for miniature painting that probably aren't intended to be a primer. But what I, what I didn't, what I failed to understand was that um, as this, this commenter goes on to explain in a, in a couple of comments in this thread, um, I never, I don't use. Games Workshop's spray cans. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I think I used Chaos Black sporadically. Um, I've actually recently started doing the airbrush surface primer again, um, which is a completely different topic. But oh, oh, let's come back to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I assumed just from the way that everyone talks that Chaos Black, Grey Sear and everything are factually marketed as a primer and called primer and, and things like that turns out they're not um and again as this comment goes on to explain there's certain um tick boxes that you have to have within the chemical makeup of the paint in order to sell it as a primer um so technically chaos black isn't a primer um but what that does tell me is that i guess there are cans out there that aren't factually primers that can work as a primer on plastic models because if you look at um the listing on games workshop's website for chaos black it doesn't say primer it says undercoat yeah and it says that it undercoats plastic mm -hmm. but it doesn't say that it's a primer but in there like there's there's a few bits of literature with games workshop and tutorial videos and stuff where they specifically state that you can prime with them. Mm -hmm. They say the word prime. They don't say it in their listing of the thing. Um, so what that actually says to me is that I'm potentially was just a bit naive to the fact that I guess there are cans out there that aren't called primers yeah. that can work just fine going straight onto plastic models. I do think, though, that your point does stand because I do think this does get into like semantics a little bit because the point was to use a product that is designed for miniatures. That's and that, more, that product that, is that, designed for miniatures. If you bought something that was factually a primer, but it's designed for like filling damage on a car and the like the pigment is massive and it's going to like destroy all the detail in your model, you might be like, oh, yeah, it's technically a primer, so it's technically correct. But if yeah, you just use something I, I think. I, I just got, I mixed up terminology or like used terminology a bit uh, loosely. Yeah. So where I understood it, but then like coming across to the listeners, it might not have translated as well. So they've, the, they've got a great point and I'm glad that they explained it all. Um, but I think the point is more that all that proves to me is that as it turns out, there are cans out there designed for minutes painting that you can use as primers that aren't sold as primers. I think it's one of those things where like, if it works, it works. And I want to tie this into your point about the airbrush primer. I've used uh, Citadel cans as a primer, as a base coat, as an undercoat, like as intended hundreds of times. And I've never had a problem with paint not sticking to the model after that. It has worked as a primer, whether branded for that or not. It's worked absolutely perfectly. I've used airbrush primer that is designed to prime a model mm -hmm. and it comes off immediately. It's been terrible. So I think it's one of those things where just because it's marketed for one thing doesn't necessarily mean it can't be used for another. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, that's a different like conversation. Like you said, if you're buying like cheap cans that aren't designed for miniature painting and then the paint's rubbing off, yeah, that's a problem. But if yeah. it's not a problem and it is working for you, I wouldn't get caught up in the like, oh, technically it's incorrect. But like, there's a yeah. lot of products that we use aren't that aren't designed for what we're using for, or maybe they are, and we use them for a different purpose. Let your toothbrush. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm cling I, film. Yeah, cling film. I, I'm going to jump in. This Tupperware. Is the, the Tupperware. <laughs> this is the new black base room, isn't it? This is like we started the year off with the new, the new controversial thing. I mean, what what I would say is this: I've used Chaos Black since I started painting miniatures. You know, t over 28 years ago, however long it was. You know, so a long, long, long time. Um, you're quite right. On the Games Workshop website, it says that it's an undercoat. Um, you know, and it says that it can be used for undercoated. And I just want to say that, like, there, someone pointed out in the comments, a really good thing that priming and undercoating are very different things. Okay. Um, touching on your point on, on sort of like car industry primers and stuff like that, your, the bigger pigmentation flakes, they, they cause the paint to be so thick on the model. Like I hear, I see a lot of people talk about Halford's uh, gray car primer or 
I've seen that on models and it, it is super thick and super even it, even other art spray cans because I've used like do you know uh, Montana spray cans that like, like graffiti yeah. arts and stuff I I had those already and I tried using them as models and did not work yeah real real but, problem that they, they they do have a, a much higher size of pigment flake and the problem with that is it does cause thickness especially when you're trying to retain detail on the model and exactly your point that you said about surface primer I've used surface primer countless times and it's flaked off, scratched, rubbed off. It's not adhered very well to the miniature and the paint on top of that layer. The, I think the point that I was trying to tail onto yours from the last episode was that like it's it's the name, the Chaos Black Spray Can has been around for 20 plus years. It's They've not changed it. They've not changed the way that it works. They've not changed the name of it. It's the only paint in the Games Workshop range that retains the very, the OG name. It's, it's been designed for a purpose. My point was, was that when you put when you put any layer of color onto a miniature and un undercoat it and actually undercoat the miniature, you should always do that rather than just spraying a colored can onto the model and then just basically edging it or pin shading, etc. That's the thing I'm saying is always undercoat it, preferably with a gray, white or black, which is what I said on the last episode, and then put a can over the top. I use, even though on the Games Workshop website, all the cans stipulate they can be used as an undercoat. So I went and checked this after seeing some of the comments and stuff. I, I think they all say... They all say the same kind of information info. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they're all built the same. Yeah. They're all intended to go straight onto plastic. You could do as far as Games Workshop are concerned. Correct. Yeah. You could essentially do like a double layer of Mephiston Red spray can, and it would be the same as doing a layer of Chaos Black and then Mephiston Red on the top, if that makes sense. My point that I was trying to make is that I've always done an undercoat of black and then put a color over the top of it as my base coat, main color of the thing or the several layers of the main color or whatever. Um, but that was what I was trying to get across is that you should undercoat, put a layer on and then put another layer on top of it so that you've got a double layer, basically. Um, that's yeah. the point I was trying to make with that. But, um, yeah. but, but yeah. Great, great comment though. I, I, I think sometimes it's difficult for us to have these conversations and like remember that the listeners don't have the context of all of our previous conversations between each other and terminology that's yeah. used and things like that. So it's like anything like that where it comes across the wrong way, I'd really like to hear about it so we can like talk about it a little bit more. Fact also just sometimes your wordage can trip you up. You might say something that isn't the correct word of what you meant. hundred percent. I mean. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Um, and cause I, even you, you kind of clarified that with me after we recorded and I was like, Oh no, I meant that. And you were like, Oh, Oh, okay. Like, um, yeah. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Seed Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at cstudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission with us by using code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Okay. Uh, one final comment. Uh, John Jays says, uh, I definitely think George is onto something with his fourth pillar of the hobby uh, being collecting. I've never played a game of 40K in my life. I love the lore, but I don't have uh, any time to really deep dive into it. And I have zero patience for painting, but I want to collect an army. Guess that makes me the perfect potential uh, siege client. Love the podcast. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Yep. Cstudios.co.uk yep. slash... Get yeah, dash a dash, dash quote. quote yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say contact, but it's not that yeah, anymore. Is not it? That no, anymore. link no. in the description. No, anyway, the description. But but um, yeah, I think collecting is a massive part of part of this as well. Like again, it's something that having something physical from your childhood that you remember from the shop is is really nice. I think that's something like. And I don't think it's just a childhood. It's thing. not always from me, just like it's not always true, from your childhood. It's, it's like I said on the last one when you. But I do think you're massively onto that. No one actually really talks about that side of it other than mentioning like, oh, grey pile of shame or blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, I hear GW I, referencing like, oh, collect an army, but I never hear about it in the context of like, that's why a lot of people do it. Like just collecting stuff. It's like I said to you, as soon as you mentioned that, I was like, oh yeah, that's actually why I even considered doing it again. Do you know what I mean? Like was was the the collecting and the having a cool collection. I don't think cool people stuff. see it as a collector hobby in the way that they no. do like, Magic the Gathering or, no. you know, like no, I, collecting I, figurines. Weird, I, I don't it? think a lot of people go into the shops, buy the boxes and then don't open them and sit them on the shelf. Like the, the new kind but of stuff. But even collect, I'm talking about collecting, um, you know, finished models or collecting ju just like... I don't think it's just... It, I don't just mean in the context of not opening the box. I mean, just like collecting... Being, being them, a like, collection doesn't mean it needs to stay in the box. Oh, okay. Like, right. like 
you could have them in display cabinets and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no one really talks about that side of it, do they? I know that there's definitely a lot of people, like we hear about this, um, you know, people who like just building the models and like that's how they enjoy it. I know that there's tons of people that buy models, build them. That was their fix. They go in a cabinet, done. I'd call that a collection. Yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Topic this week, hacks to paint your army faster and easier. So me and James, Joe, a little bit, we painted between us like thousands of models, right? And yeah, I've contributed like 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've done more than that, actually. I've painted more, I've painted more than 10. 11 with the BL10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give myself some credit. Uh, no, point being, we've all like got a fair amount of experience with, with painting different projects, different color schemes and so on. And one thing that I thought about um, actually off the back of our question of the week last week, which was about painting split color schemes, I thought, I don't think people realize when they're planning their color scheme how well that ties into how efficiently and how quickly sort of the min max is on mm -hmm. getting that army done. So for example, with this, like say you're going to be painting blood angels and you want them to have like the, the classic red with like the modern style gold trim. I know that James likes black trim and I know that that's just like an aesthetic choice, but it got me thinking, I've spoken a little bit before about how you can substitute paints that have like better coverage for something else. That's sort of the, the time visual crossover there. Um, I guess the planning stage is really, really important for your color scheme. And I know a lot of people are like looking to start an army and they're like, oh, I'm not sure what colors to do. But I think if you're someone who's looking at it from an angle of speed, like if from the get-go you want an army and you know you want to have it done within a certain time frame, and that's important to you, or you know you've got limited time, I think that there's a lot of tricks you can do when planning your color scheme that are going to still look great, but save you a lot of time just from like what seems like a very arbitrary color choice of like, I'm going to use black for the trim instead of gold, it might actually result in over the course of doing a 2000 point army, it might save you like 20 total hours just from base coating in or just from the fact of you haven't got a great paint in your collection that serves that job really well, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, James, I'm wondering if you've got any uh, efficiency tips. I think limited palette, I've said this before on a previous episode, but I think limited palette is really important. I think that Again, we all get blinded by colour sometimes when we're starting a new project. You, you you look at all the colours that you've got in, in your paint range or accessible paints um, and you start, oh, I could use this, I could use this. I, could, I think being quite brutal with choices and having a, fix, a fixed palette of what you are going to be using and what it's going to be used for. Say, for example, like we're getting an army done quickly. If you've got an army that has lots of decoration on it, let's just take maybe, for example, like Black Templars, or let's take, take an, a, 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 an army that has even more detail than that, for, for example, like Custodians or things like that. Like, um, I think being a bit more like, right, okay, well, the model's going to have these gold details on it, but it's also got these details. Like, do you do you need to use like a bronze for that detail or a different, slightly different gold for that one or whatever, or can it all be gold? I think making really conformed decisions to, to basically go, right, well, here's my 15 colors that I'm going to be using on the army. And this color can be used for this, 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 and this can be used for this. I think really in the planning stage, I always bang on about, I think having that really sort of like brutal to the line decision on what the colors are going to be used for from the start will help massively. Um, the thing you mentioned about black, for example, on Blood Angels is, is exactly not, not only are you nodding to, to second edition really well, but also the, after putting the reds onto the model, Black is the first color I will paint always because it's the m next majority color. And it means I can do all the things like gun casings, plasteel armor, rubberized bits, um, the trims on the on the pauldrons or the shoulder pads. You just, know, like. just to jump in with that quickly as well, that works really well because black covers really well over any color. Whereas gold, for example, especially maybe the gold in particular that you like to use might not cover very well Correct. over red and you might have to base coat it black to do it gold anyway. So that's already a step that you've cut out. Well, you, you even get like the benefit of tidying up. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just the benefit of old base coating it is easier because it covers better. It's like when you have to tidy up over it because you've spilled onto it. Sometimes if you're, if you're having to paint like, if you've painted like yellow or something and then you spill black onto that, you're tidying up that yellow for like ages. Yeah. Whereas if you were doing like, like you say, black trims or something and you spill some, some red on there, it's like one coat tidied up, done. Yeah. I think the other thing that that teaches is obviously knowledge of paint, um, which I, we take on about quite a lot. And also as well, like I think I'll always say this, in that situation where if you get black and make a mistake with the black, it is harder for you to, to tidy it up. I think it forces you to be neater. 
which for me directly translates to practicing your pressure management and brush control to make sure you don't make those mistakes. I think that's one of the things when you're combining multiple things, then you're combining obviously like an efficient painting process. You're combining obviously care and attention and focus. And then you're also combining paint knowledge as well. And I think with those three things, the speed of production for the army will inherently come anyway, as a result of doing those three things, you are quite right. If you are using a color that has great coverage, but is super stark and super high contrast to the inherent base coat of the miniature, you are then going to be spending ages covering refixing mistakes i think I yeah that. well i was kind of going the other way where it's like if you because i would assume in that case maybe that's another point to touch on is like picking the order that you do the colors in in terms of what's gonna need less tidy up yeah. if you go back over that's, it that's why it. test models are so important for that um yeah. not even necessarily just doing one I think people think of test models as I'm going to paint this model so that I can see what the finished thing is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But I do test models as a, okay, this is my process. Process test. This is the colors I want to use. This is like the order of step. Like you're going to learn from doing that one model. Like, okay, I should have actually done this step before this other step because then that skips a cleanup stage or whatever. And then I think as well, doing a secondary test model after that, implementing all the, the points that you wanted to make to see how well they actually do work and see if you can even like refine it even more. That's exactly what happened to me in my Pathfinder kill team. I did that first model and I um, primed it black and then sprayed the orange armor color onto the uh, Pathfinders. Mm -hmm. And then as I was painting that, I realized it's pretty much 50-50 like brown cloth and orange um, armor. And I probably should have just sprayed the the brown on because I, I, after I sprayed the orange, I went and had to black out everything else so that it wasn't orange. So I was building from black rather than building from orange. Whereas if I had just sprayed it brown, it's a much least, dark color, I can yeah. still just at least like, um, I could probably just build off of brown because hmm. it's a dark brown, the same way that I would build off of, of black. So it's like, Instantly, I was like, oh, okay, I know to swap that round for the next time. And it was just so much quicker the next time. Yeah. A quick little like contradictory thought that I've just had specifically when talking about, for example, the Blood Angel uh, trim thing. Gold might be slower, but I guess this goes for other details as well. Metallics, you can get away with doing less in terms of effort. Like metallic base coat wash, you can call it a day for tabletop. Yeah. Whereas if you might certain colors like you might have to do an edge highlight and you might think well i'm not very good at edge highlighting i might get a better looking result in less time by doing that well on that note uh if the aim if you're not specifically tied to certain law or something or we've spoken about you know specifically with space marines i don't want to only give advice for space marines but specifically with space marines um and chaos marines and stuff you can normally find a successor chapter or warband or whatever that matches a different color scheme that you like. So if you like the law of one and you like the color scheme of another, you can normally find some middle ground there. Or you can you can paint them however you want anyway, so you don't need to follow the law. Metallic color schemes in general are probably going to be a way of getting something done quicker because you do have less to do with them in it's, general. It's, it's, it's like, for example, like um, uh, Iron Ravens, Paul Norton's chapter and stuff like that, like that getting getting to the 50% mark is, is a lot quicker because you've got that, that metallic color scheme on there as well. We've referenced that before as one that can look amazing yeah, yeah, and yeah. still potentially help you cut some corners because of the, the metallics. I mean, if you're painting it to the level of his ones, you're still going to be spending ages exactly. on it I don't anyway. think it's about cutting um, corners. It's about it's just inherently more efficient to do. It's just a strategic process. It's just a strategic process to get to a point whereby it looks good quicker. That's, that's the thing. You're being really selective with those colors and the processes of application to get to you to that point. Um, and I think that's really what does separate people who can paint armies efficiently from people who paint armies with passion. I think that's the, that's the huge divide between those two things. And I think whether you paint, you try and you try and get a middle ground, which is, I love this faction. I love this, but I'm also going to do this in the most strategic way. I think there's a happy, there can be a happy medium that still gets you the army produced in a decent time frame, but you still are able to do all the things that you love about that faction. I think there is a happy medium for that. I think on that point as well, and especially me just saying that we don't want to only bang on about space marines, but 
I think army choice does actually come into it because there's one hundred percent. If your aim is okay, I need it done. I want this done easy, fast, and still look good. Then the army choice does come into it because certain armies are going to be able you're going to be able to do that easier than than others. If you've got, uh, you know, if you've got like a thing with loads of different textures and stuff on it then you're not going to be able to none of this advice is actually going to you're not going to be able to put it in are you because it's like you've still got to go in and cut in and paint different things so, so, so like like if you're wanting to paint an army really quickly um like i'd be going necrons i'd be going nids i'd be going things like that like that's combining the metallic approach with also color selection and choice that you can get an efficient army done very very quickly um, material is very relevant because yeah. more natural elements uh, even things like cloth like because they're not manufactured like machined parts you can get away with mistakes so much easier and they're so much less noticeable it's just do a demon's army if you've got an airbrush <laughs> yeah there you go yeah. well, I throw the airbrush into the mix it's got a whole different conversation <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah I mean yeah I, or spray can you usually sit in our spray cans as we've been talking about earlier yeah I, I think I think yeah if you're, you know there, there are some armies like for example there are armies that are super detailed both in sculpt for example the likes of custodians um, maybe even grey knights um, I know they're still silver but they they have like a combination of like really easy to apply concentric colour but at the same time they've got a whole swathe of extra details on I them. think marines are like a sleeper high detailed army like, like they people, don't they look are. like there's a lot going on but there actually is yeah. a lot when you get yeah. into it especially with the characters yeah I, th I think yeah i think i say like for, for for efficient if you want to produce an army very quickly i think necrons can be done very very quickly very efficiently i think um nids can be done very quickly very efficiently um i think uh, uh, probably one of the the most difficult in my opinion is probably death watch because death watch you've got it's so you've got unique so each, each model is unique each model has a unique chapter pa chapter pauldron or shoulder pad before that, that's before you even talk about adding on like, like uh, the the space wolf one will have a couple of wolf pelt tassels on his leg, or the blood angel will have some some uh, bardenite diamonds on hanging off from somewhere. Or it doesn't or, batch well either because like, they're all so unique to each other. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like if you look at uh, Adam Langton's ones, it's like every single one is basically a, a character, character yeah. that's been converted. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like yeah, that's an intercessor, <laughs> and it's like built <laughs> off of Ragnar Blackmane or something. It's yeah. Like, okay. Cool. Yeah. I think that's that's a perfect example. Adam's Adam's death watch army is. That's that's an example of how n not to approach an army if you want it to be easy and quick. Yeah, because his, his, his army is is a, a massive passion project where every single model has a, such a high interest and and, and um, backstory and narrative where he's thought about that character individual, or that squad or that sergeant or whatever. Which Death Watch does... It, that, that does lend it works to quite well yeah. yeah it works perfectly but um but yeah like you know i would love to just uh, you know maybe as a challenge at some point in the future to just try and see how quick you know uh producing an army like a necron army or like a nid army or, or i'll probably go necrons all day long actually thinking about it just because the, 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 i think you can do a really great paint job and, and, and colour scheme on an army. Hear that, Joe? No excuse for not well, I've got about 2,000 points built at home if you want to give it a go. <laughs> that could save you some time. I just sold a fair few of it, but I've still got some. Still got I, some I think I think that, that could be something quite interesting just to see how, how efficient and, and, and quick something like that could be done. In my defence, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't doing metallic Necrons. No, you weren't. So you I, had a whole, was an error. I had a whole thing planned. But yeah. Um, and the more, do you know what? The more we talk about it, the more I'm like, oh, I really want to paint one of them. I so, might just do like one of the characters or something. Joe's Necron army is the same as my Mordian army. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think it's more going to be like your Admech army, yeah, your fabled right. Admech yeah. army. I, I don't know where this. I, I've got to say this now. I, I don't know where that came from because I never said I was collecting an army of it. You was for two weeks solidly <laughs> obsessed. With starting an Admec army, you said to me in these exact words, I am going to start an Admec army. Say, did he say it on air? Not on air. These are multiple okay. conversations that we okay. had in person. I he was running around with codexes. He was showing me models on eBay. He was getting obsessed I, with it. I, I had an urge and, and, and a niche. I told you that. So to, to paint some yeah. Admec. And so, I'm yeah. just saying, I think that's more what it is for me. Maybe I just need to get a Necron character out of my system. The audacity to try and pretend that you weren't going to start an army. <laughs> it wasn't an army. Like, it wasn't an army. Uh, but yeah. Um, 
one potential spanner that I sort of want to throw into this is color theory, I think is a boring subject for most people, especially on the hobbyist level. However, I do think it's an important one to not gloss over in the sense of picking complementary colors to your scheme strategically for the, like I said, for the min max of like best aesthetic to maximum time sync. So for example, um, with the BL Tan model that I'm painting for BL Tanuary, uh, it's got Power Sword. And I had a few options to go with that because the main color scheme is this really like vibrant green and white. And I guess you've got a neutral there and only really one accent color. So you can kind of kind of hit from a lot of different angles. Purple was the sort of secondary color that I was doing is the accent for the green. Initially, I was going to do the Power Sword, like uh, blue, red, like something very vibrant. I wasn't having a great time with it. And also the upside of doing this like dark purple that is a complementary color works really well with the model, but it's a paint that covers really well because it's quite dark. It blends really well because the the paints that I have in, in my purples range are really smooth. They glaze down nicely. But like lighter, brighter colors do show stains and mistakes easier just because just because they're so like, uh, they've got higher luminance. Like you can see the mistakes because they're so bright. Like if you make a mistake with gray over black, it does tend to sort of like, disappear it's not super super obvious i do think that picking like your accent colors in your force strategically in the sense of not just going like okay i'm doing red so i'm going to do green accents it's like okay well could you do purple accents could you do blue well, that's accents? A, that, that's like trying hard. to work that in so so you're, you're talking about like harmonious colors so for example you've got the color that you're choosing as the main color you've got the complement of that and then you're you, you're choosing the sister or cousin color next to the complement to work with the inherent color. Exactly. And strategically yeah. as well, picking one of those, because you've got multiple options when you start going into the subdivisions on the color wheel, you've got multiple options to pick from. It's not just like I'm picking the polar opposite. You've got two or three like tertiary colors within that. Pick the one that is going to be most efficient to paint based on tests that you do in your test model, based on the paint range that you have, rather than yeah. just picking the one that you go, oh, that looks cool. Let's do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, you, yeah. you might like the tone or the hue of the colour, but the coverage might be absolutely trash and it takes you three hours to block it in. So, so yeah. Especially I mean, if you're doing like, say you're doing like a purple scheme. We had this with the Leviathan models. Like yeah. we've done a purple colour scheme. James like, let's do yellow accents. I'm like, yeah, great. But yellow paints are horrible and I don't like using them and they're slow. So I was, I'm sitting there for like 45 minutes trying to base cut a helmet because uh, when you use flash, it gets yellow. Did you, did you stick the helmet onto the model though? That's the question. No, you airbrushed yours. You, you got a complete <laughs> cop out. Yeah. No, I was efficient. I airbrushed the <laughs> Color on, like yeah, temporary sub assembly. Yeah, TSA. TSA. Come on. Well, I, I had a bit of a problem with them because they were the push fit ones, and I didn't think. Oh, that what an excuse! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at Siege, head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalog of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques, from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your paintings to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash C studios. So just as a, I don't know, like a few like examples then, if someone ignore existing chapters, they don't want to match, um, you know, the law. If we take space Marines as an example, sorry, everyone, uh, in Beale Tanuary as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if you wanted a kind of vibrant green color scheme for the armor, what are sort of the colors that you would lean to on some of the other details? I would immediately off the bat, min, like James said, minimize the amount of color choices, right? Mm -hmm. I'm picking maybe one main secondary color for like trim, Aquila, accents, that sort of thing. Making it a neutral helps because it's not really adding any complication to the scheme. It's not, it's like a non-choice almost, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have black, that might be like, that might cover a significant portion of the model, but it's not really a color choice. It's sort of a get out of jail free card, if you get what I mean. Yeah. If you've done black trim, that's like a non-choice. It doesn't really affect your color scheme in the sense of it's not going to make your green look less green or, and so on. So I'd probably do that for like the majority details. Then within that, I'm picking metallics for any like trinkets or anything, like any extra details, mm -hmm. like, uh, maybe Aquila, anything that have got around the pouches, weapons, full metallic. Because like I said, especially if you're picking some nice metallics that cover well, 
you haven't got to do a lot to make them look good. Like, mm. especially at tabletop level, that might just be a base coat or it might just be a base coat and a wash or it might be like a base coat wash, one highlight. Mm. You can do a lot with that. So you're wasting most of the time on like, especially with Space Marines, because they are like 85, 90%, like that main armor color. Mm. You can spend all of your time on that. And then if you're going purely for the sake of efficiency and speed, picking color choices that don't detract from your color scheme. So I'm not going to pick like red trim because it's like a, fancy color scheme like hack color wheel harmonious color whatever not trying to get fancy with that just picking a neutral non-choice like black or like a metallic because one they cover really well over basically anything mm -hmm. and two you haven't got to do a lot of steps on that color to make it look good so really like one of the key takeaways from this could be regardless of whatever model you're painting pick the color that you want it to be mostly you still want to enjoy the you know looking at them or something maybe still consider how easy that is to apply as the main color but outside of that i know i i just tabled green as an example there but pretty much everything you just said could apply to any color yeah definitely really. i think as well like you can make nods to a secondary color that you might want in small ways that are quick so for example with the bl tan model that i'm doing I done, it's like 80% white. The only other, the, the whole color scheme is white and green. The only green on the model was just the helmet. And I was thinking there's not actually enough green going on. I just done green gemstones, which is a very, very small surface area of the model, but it pops really well against the white. And especially where like the gems are placed on the model, like they're in spots where there's not a lot behind them. So they, they really stand out. That added tons of visual interest very very low effort because it's a small detail but it it's a complementary color that worked with the scheme and worked with the army scheme but it it wasn't a big time sink yeah so it's almost like picking a your main color picking a, a neutral second color black if you can get away with it because it's just so easy to do seven or like a white five, or a silver or something like that yeah but yeah. and then saving your complementary color like you were just saying like for example the red being the fancy color wheel choice for green mm -hmm. saving that for smaller details so that it's still there but you don't have to worry about it that which much. ties in perfectly to what i said on the show a couple of weeks ago where i said spending time on small details is what counts. Is what counts, and it's what will make your army stand out and look really, really good. It's strategically picking things that other people are going to gloss over to make your model have that extra wow factor. And for things specifically like gems and lenses, they're very, very quick and easy to do. A lot of people skimp out on them because they seem like something that's just very negligible, not important, but it adds a lot of visual interest. It's very, very easy to do. It can tie into your color scheme and make what is a pretty bland color scheme look more interesting. Yep. It's going to make your army stand mm. out. It's very, very efficient way to get an army looking really, really nice. Mm. And I think the time that you the time that you save by doing that first covering of the neutral tone, by getting that, again, you're going to be layering really consistently, obviously with a really good coverage of paint. The time you do save on that allows you to then invest that nominal, minimal amount of time with that high contrast complementary color on those little details to do exactly that. I think that's one of the real, real important things. So I think, yeah, you don't really need to go too crazy with it. Um, we always talk about, but color theory is, is, is like, there's a lot to it and i think that having a minimal understanding of just complementary harmonious just gives you those abilities to make those choices for those little details so much easier i don't think it's something that you really need to like even know why what you're doing makes sense just knowing it does work so if you look at a color wheel when you look at one of the ones that's got like the triangle sort of already sketched onto it you can just look at the color that you want and just follow those guidelines and even if you can't make sense of it and you don't want to do that research on why these colors work with each other just knowing that that's like a guide to help you and just having that hold your hand and make you make a choice that you know is going to work. Yeah. It gives you those options and looking at that color wheel, especially the ones that have got the guidelines on them, just Google image search. I love, color the, wheel. I love the one. Do we still sell those color wheels? We do. Yeah. We, so on the store, we've got some color wheels and it like, you can like turn. It's like a dial. It's like a dial and you can turn and see how like the different colors tint the other colors and stuff like that. I, Sometimes I'll just sit there and play with it. Just like say, oh, I wonder what that does. Or a fidget toy. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I do think sitting with one of those, and even if you don't want to do the research and know why, just knowing that that is a tool that can aid you and looking at it, if you go, if you look at it and go, right, okay, this is my main color. These are the ones that are going to work with it. Looking at these three colors that I know are going to go with it according to the color wheel, which do I think is going to be most efficient to paint? Let's do a test. Yeah. Yeah. That'll help massively.
quite a few takeaways there then really quite a few good uh good points question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week if you have a question that you'd like us to answer in this segment of the show please leave a comment down below on youtube or if you're listening on any of the audio platforms via us dm at siege studios on instagram this question comes from jonathan thompson who says uh tips for mold line removal it takes me ages and slows me right down but others are way quicker and get to gluing and painting way quicker I'm currently using a hobby knife running along it, often not in one go, so I press lightly, but sometimes I end up cutting a millimeter off or flattening details on parts like piping. I, I've, I've struggled with this quite a lot. It, it feels like one of those things that people just assume that it's easy to pick up kind of thing. Like So when when most people explain how to remove mold lines, I feel like the they don't go into too much detail. Mm. It's just like, oh yeah, run, run and the then knife. You scrape them. Run the, run the knife along the mold line and uh, it's gone. It's done. And it's like, well, there's a little bit more to it than that. Cause I keep messing up my models. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, do use a knife, but the blade on the knife is the same blade that's been on there for about 15 years. Uh, it is blunt as anything. Um, the, the, can, less of a knife more of a spoon more yeah, respect, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying get some kitchen cutlery um, the, the, the the thing is is um, the mold line remover tool that probably a lot of people are familiar with from Games Workshop it, it isn't sharp it's just an edge that is blunt but it's quite an acute edge if that it's makes almost sense. like it scoops it scoops the mold yeah. line off Kind it, of thing. The problem that the 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 the, the question the, the question the person who's asking the question is struggling with is because the knife is sharp, it's it's obviously biting in and taking chunks of plastic off. And the problem with that is obviously you, there is that fear of creating the the, the damage to the detail. If you do use a very blunt blade, um, it literally makes it a lot easier. And that also combines with like the same thing with brushes, but with pressure management. If you're applying quite a lot of pressure to it, anything, even something that's still quite blunt if you apply a lot of pressure it's still going to carve if that makes sense so i would be just advised to just use something that maybe is a lot blunter a blade that you've had on the side and used a lot you can blunt blades on foam you can cut foam with blades before and that blunts them quite quickly um so you can do that if you want to make like a, a, a your own sort of like blade that, that is a bit more blunt um don't start getting files and filing them flat and stuff like that it's just a bit too much but but um but yeah a blunt blade and then i'm going to pull out the classic which i always go on about which is tamiya uh sanding sponges or sanding foam like it, pin in it, that pin in the sanding foam yeah hot take i use a very 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 sharp uh, knife uh, so, I so i was about to say this so i think it comes down to one specific thing because i've experimented with both and because i've always had james on my left saying to use a blunt knife and George on my right saying to use a sharp knife. I think it comes down to, I've, I've had better success with a sharp knife. Can I, can I give the pitch for the sharp knife? Just, just, I know you're itching. I do. I, I'm just going to throw <laughs> this itching, in there well. just, No, let me, let me talk. Let me talk. I know you're both like absolutely gagging to get your argument in. Um, the, the difference that I found was it's whether you, want to be applying a lot of pressure or not because yep. when i'm using the sharp knife if you're naturally applying a lot of pressure while while doing this and you're using the sharp knife that's why you're scraping millimeters off of your model what i now prefer to do i noticed that even with something blunt i was applying pressure and kind of still just like not necessarily scraping bits off but i was like denting the models and like damaging the models with a really sharp knife i literally am not applying any pressure pretty much i'm like running it so lightly along the mold line and mm. it's just coming straight off um personally for me that works a lot better but it, no. it, hang on hang on it is it is muscle memory and it is obviously depending on how much pressure you do and i want to just add on to that this is hilarious that you're so yeah. both like yeah, we both are yeah because so... cleanup is so important we're both like super hot on, on cleanup like it's really important um i use a blunt my blunt yellow handled scalpel that I've had for a long, 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 long time. I use that, but I also do use a sharp blade as well. So it's it's fluctuating the pressure that you use depending on how stubborn or difficult. I mean, the I've is. seen you use a box car. <laughs> that works the same. It, again, it, it is more it's more about the pressure that you actually use exactly, at yeah. all yeah, than it is. Thing. It comes down and, to and I do. I know George is going to bang on about bang on about sharp blades, and I do agree with him hundred percent. I'm not saying I mean, there's no sort of like sharp or blunt. It's how, it's how you're here. using it's, them, isn't it? It's it how you use it. Yeah, and what you find easiest if you want to apply more pressure I'd go with a blunt one if so you, you want 
to not apply any pressure. I'm just going to keep talking so George doesn't get to explain his point. The, the, last, uh, the, the last bit that I add in is that where the, my blunt old scalpel works really well is on metal and resin. It works really, really well on those because I find that the sharp blade will dig into the resin way more because it's a softer material than the plastic. So I use, I use a, a, a fluctu I fluctuate between the two for the different material that I'm actually working on as well, yeah. which is the other thing. We haven't really got much experience with that because we're just a couple of young guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've been cooking on this. I'm ready to go now. <laughs> go. The sharpness of the blade is not the problem. I'm going to have to do a visual aid here. I'm sorry for the audio listeners. It is the angle at which you are scraping the model. Mm -hmm. How sharp the blade is, is almost irrelevant. You can have the sharpest blade in the world. It's all to do with the angle in which you're scraping. So when you're scraping the mold line, if, this is, if my hand here is the mold line and this is the blade, if I'm going in this direction, you want the, instead of having the blade like horizontal like this and scraping, that's how you're going to get the, the stuttering, the jagged sort of this, or you're going to take too much material off. Mm -hmm. If you're coming at a very, very shallow angle like this, the blade is not cutting into it and you can have a lot more finesse with your application because mold lines are not a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. Even just on different parts of a model, you'll find that some mold lines are very, very thick due to where it's been cast. Some are, are, are almost like non-existent. Mm -hmm. Having a very, very sharp blade gives you the option of adjusting that angle depending on how deep the mold line is. If you've got a very, very blunt mold line, uh, remove a tool, and you've got a very, very big mold line, you'll find that you keep on having to make pass after pass after pass after pass. And that's when you start scuffing up detail and getting flat spots. Mm -hmm. If you came at that with a very, very sharp blade and you started creeping up on it, you're coming at it from a very, very shallow angle. You're barely taking any material off. But because it's a sharp blade, it's capable of shaving off microns at a time. If you made that very, very shallow angle pass with a blunt hobby knife, it's not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. All it's going to do is just depress and deform that mold line. It's going to flatten it out rather than cutting into it. The, uh, that's a very good explanation. I can see like the steam coming off. <laughs> um, Literally cooking. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I mean, it's completely that. I do still think the sharpness does come into play with, with how much pressure you're putting on it. Cause even if you're holding it at that course, angle, yeah. yep. if you're used to putting a lot of pressure on it, completely even agree. at that angle, you're going to be, digging in and, and taking more off and scraping more off than you want. So, um, so, so really, as, as, as a kind of like a grand summary for this, try with different tools and try fluctuating pressure and angle, and then you will find that, that at one point it clicks and it works. As a little inner question hack, get the edge of plastic card and practice taking off the minimal amount of that edge on the plastic card that you can. And that will get that will tune your hand and pressure and angle and everything to just making sure that you're only taking off the very very absolute fine edge of that of that edge on the plastic card. Yeah, and that works really well. I mean, part of the reason I like using the sharp ones as well is because you've got that really really nice sharp point at the tip. You can reach in very very tight yeah. areas. Yeah. If especially if you've got like uh, you know those like shoulder pads that have like rivets and stuff on them, it's a very very small gap but there is a mold line it might be like a two mil gap with like detail on either side and you've got to sort of get in this crevice being able to scrape that it, with a, a difficult like a mold line remover it's not going to happen with a box cutter it's not going to happen with a blunt hobby knife that's got like super glue and like crap on the end of it it's not going to work mm -hmm. so i was going to say about um the the common one that i can think of is in the the bottom of a magazine on a space marines gun you got mm -hmm. the, yeah where it's all like yep. uh or on like piping rigid. like the the question the question said yeah. yeah 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 so it's all like rigid mm -hmm. um that those types of ones i've ended up i've kind of resigned to just using the the sanding sponge now yeah. to be honest unless it's like a particularly thick mold line that's running through those things well that's going to tie in so well with this week's hobby hack <laughs> oh. <laughs> look at that segue <laughs> so I am a user of Tamiya Extra Thin Poly Cement. Mm -hmm. It's called Extra Thin. It has this like, I, this like, is it called like a pillier action when Capillary it like action. flows yeah. into place? Yeah. It, it it, the viscosity almost, of the glue. It's almost like a contrast yeah. paint. The nice thing about it is it's a very, very weak glue. It's not like getting your Citadel glue and like, you know, when you like accidentally get like your finger on it and you've like, you ruin the model. It's not like that. Even if you like, if you, if you took the stuff straight out of the pot and you brushed it onto the, like, the Space Marine's face, like it's not going to ruin it. I, I wouldn't do that, but like, you know, you, you might get away with, with having some spill. 
this is great for stuff like very, very fine piping or like a grenade that's got like a weird mold line going through it. Any really, really fine detail like that that you'll find you're drawn to using like a sanding sponge for. I find that just getting some of that Tamiya extra thin, getting all the excess off of your brush and just using that brush applicator tool, just making a pass over it. If it's a thin mold line, if it's quite a thick one, I mean, unfortunately, I'm going to have to scrape it. But if it's quite a thin one, or you want to just sort of creep up on it, you've gone like 80% of the way with the sanding sponge and you just want to get that last little bit, it will dissolve that because it's mm. it, it eats through the plastic and melts it. But it has this like smoothing action. It's not really like a glue. It's a very strange product. But I also find that it's very, very good for, like in the sense of uh, you're doing the cleaning stage. Say, you know how sometimes when you're in like a really, really tight, uh, area and you're scraping off a mold line you know when you get or you've been using the sanding sponge you know you get that sort of like dust that kind of like doesn't really want to you can't really just sort of like get it off it's just sort of there especially if it's like just barely still stuck on to the model like it's where you've scraped something and it's not it, it it's shaved it but it's not quite come off at the tip getting that tamiya extra thin cement in there and going over like a rivet or something will just instantly dissolve and make everything disappear and then just from the surface action of how the product works, it's just going to dissipate, spread all over, become really, really smooth, and it's just going to smooth that entire area out. Great yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, nice. I've never really heard those applications for it before. Yeah, it's not a great, like, I, I do use it for glue, and if you do, like, a couple of layers and you put it on quite thick, it will work. But I think there's better products for, like, gluing a model together. But in the cleanup phase, it is, like, integral for me, especially for things like um, drilling out, like, the, the barrel on, like, a weapon. You might get that like little bit of like shaving that's like inside the hole. Mm. Chucking some of this in, in there on the tip of your brush, just dissolve it, vanishes. It, li it literally disappears instantly. It's brilliant nice. stuff. Cool. I have to give that a go. I haven't, I haven't used Tammy Extra Thin. Um, I, I'm like you, Joe. I, I've always always been a big fan of the sanding sponges from the moment I, um, I, I started using them. I just, yeah, I love them. They're great. Cool. Should we wrap it up there? Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can find us over on patreon.com forward slash seed studios. Uh, over there, you'll find access to all of our tutorials and wonderful tuition. Uh, as well as that, we have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. We will catch you next week. Mm -hmm.